Okay, Henry, let's uh, start this off with you telling us a little bit about your story, um, what you're doing now, and everything that led to that. Okay, so at the age of 18, I guess we'll start there. I became a professional poker player, mm-hmm. and I did that. I made a living doing that and explored life and the world. I traveled a bit. And then at the age of 21, I started looking into online business, but I didn't succeed or find a way to make it work until I was 23, which is when I quit poker and focused everything on building my business. I started with advertising, then affiliate marketing, then I moved into Wake Up Cloud, which is my website and main business today. So Mm -hmm. I started in 2009 and so I've been doing that since then which is over five years, I think now. Yeah, about. (laughs) And that's where I'm at right now. I'm helping people do what they love and discover their inner authority and live life based on what feels good for them instead of listening to all of these outside factors, which is funny because I'm an outside factor telling people not to listen to outside factors. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much my story summed up. I guess you can ask more specific questions if you want to dive into anything. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I really like the idea that, you know, you talk about following your inner authority. um, And I I like the fact that it's sort of encouraging people to, to be themselves, you know. And like you said, not necessarily listening to a certain guru to be like this or be like that, but it's more you know, find what's right for you. And I think that's that's important for people to hear. Yeah, and what it comes down to is, I mean, you can listen to other people because we can't not do that. So it comes down to listening to yourself as to what kind of advice fits with you and how you can apply that to your life. Mm-hmm. All right, so yeah, tell us uh, what, you know, your concept of the inner authority is. What does that really mean? Well, what I found is that we all have something within us. Some people call it intuition. Some call it inner authority. Some call it living through feeling. Mm -hmm. I don't really get stuck on any one label because to me it all comes down to listening to yourself. And the way you do that or the way I do that is by noticing what feels alive to me. It's kind of like something feels magnetic. Mm -hmm. So it's... I want to make the distinction here because it's easy to think that if you feel like you want chocolate, then obviously that feels good because you get chocolate. But there's a distinction between sensory desire and pleasure and something that comes from deeper within us. It's it's kind of like a subtle nudge to do something. And it usually comes for me with a relaxed feeling. So it's not not that high strong feeling that desire or sensory desire Mm -hmm. comes with but something more relaxed so that's that's what i what i found that we have within us and when we listen to our own inner authority then we're automatically on the right path and it eliminate eliminates a lot of the overwhelm because we can only take one step at a time and we can only live right now So you can only do what you can with what you have. And when you do that, life becomes simpler. Mm -hmm. So the inner authority, I mean, you you talked about like, you know, having a desire for chocolate. The inner authority might not necessarily be that desire, but there might be that voice in the back of your head somewhere that's telling you that you probably shouldn't have that chocolate. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. There's also another distinction and That is that we do a lot of shooting and what we should and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So those, you could say that those get in the way of listening to our inner authority. So this is why I also stress the fact that you need to experiment with this because there's no one formula. We all have different ways of tapping into our authority. So For me, it comes down to feeling and I feel things over time. So if I need to make a decision or a big decision like buying a house or buying a car, I usually don't 
do that or try not to do that overnight because I know that my I need to go through some time and I need to let things rest. Mm-hmm. Now, for other people, they might know in the moment that they want something and when they, when they follow their feelings and their gut or heart that way, then it works out. And another example could be someone that needs to speak talk to someone they need to talk things out to really get to know what they want Mm -hmm. and so on so that's why it's important to experiment with this and usually there you've already found your thing it may be something you did in your childhood or earlier in life that you've lost touch with okay so you mentioned you know like talking to somebody else that might be your way what are some ways that we can get more in touch with this inner authority well first i'd say to start listening to yourself more Mm -hmm. and it's already there but what blocks it from or what blocks us or disconnects us from that is are the fears we have the thoughts we have of what we should do how we should behave and how th- how things should be. So it's kind of like you're holding a ball underwater, and once you stop holding it, it bounces back to the surface like mm-hmm. it does naturally. So some of the practical ways that I help people with this is simply to start unra- unraveling the fears and thoughts that hold you back because we all already have this ability It's just that we're holding us back, holding ourselves back from tapping into it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what are some practical steps? Are there any like exercises or practices that you you help people with? Let's see. Well, I'd say to start small. So you can start noticing day to day what you want to do. So instead of thinking big, like if you want to quit your job or how you feel about your job, then start smaller in, for example, if you want to read a book, then don't don't just read a book because you should read it, but read it because it feels magnetic or because it resonates with you in some way. Mm -hmm. And this is how I started because I'm naturally skeptical and I like for things to make sense. So I started small and my mind wasn't really on board because this is this as you've as you've noticed it's hard to explain and teach. So what I did was I started following what felt magnetic to me. I started reading books, I started writing and everything I've done pretty much from the age of 18 is just follow what felt interesting to me, what fascinated me what drew me in, which was poker. And then poker became lifeless. Mm -hmm. I started with online business. So the first thing I'd say is to notice the small things in your life, like books you want to see, things you want to read, small things you want to do, like explore a hobby or take a course in something. Forget about where it may lead or what goals you may have and focus on the positive feeling or the positive pull of that thing or whatever it is that mm-hmm. you want to explore. Yeah, okay. So you you talk about this this pull, this feeling, this magnetism. Let's like let's flesh that out a little bit and I guess really describe what that is and maybe give some some examples in, you know, in everyday life where you would be experiencing that pull. So people can really understand what it is and what they're experiencing. Okay, one good example would be me writing books. So a few years ago, I've always wanted to write books and Mm self-publish, but it never really happened. And then I had an opening in my schedule. So basically, I had more time suddenly. And I started bumping into things about writing or I suddenly I paid more attention to that and so I reacted to that and I felt a pull to explore more about that because again it felt interesting and I was curious Mm -hmm. 
So I guess you could say that there has to be, at least for me, some external factor that comes in and then I can react to that. Yeah, so it sounds like there'll be something, you know, in your external environment, like you said, maybe a book or, you know, like you became interested in writing um, or maybe even like a person, like a girl. Um, and it will create this sort of actual feeling in your body. Is, is that right? Do you actually feel it in your body or is it more of um, it creates an interest in your head? What, what, what sort of sensations or what are you actually experiencing? Yeah, I'd say it's a bodily feeling more than it's in my mind. So it's it's just this energy or you could say that I have energy for that. So if you think about different things, like something you, something that bores you, mm -hmm. like uh, when you were in school, like for me it was physics, had a horrible teacher that made it extremely boring. So I had no energy to do that and I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And compare that to writing a book at the, the right time a few years ago, it just kind of pulled me in. Now, I said that I need I may need something to react to from my external environment. That doesn't mean that I didn't have thoughts or ideas that got me into that place. Mm -hmm. So I might feel drawn to maybe Google something or read an article, and that's when I click a link that takes me to something about writing and I fall, and I go down the rabbit hole. And it just feels right, and I keep doing that. Now, you mentioned relationships. That's that's a bit trickier because there's a lot going on in relationships. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's more complicated, maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that could be a good example. I think like a, you know, a, a woman that you're attracted to, it does create this visceral feeling. And um, I know like for me, like, you know, for example, music and guitar is something that I'm very attracted to and resonates with me. And you mentioned that it, um, it gives you energy, you know, like when you were in physics class or whatever, you were, you had no energy for it or you, you know, you weren't pulled into it, but with something that resonates with you and pulls you in, you were sort of energized by it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think we tend to make this harder than it is. It's basically just an interest mm -hmm. towards something. And if you've never done this before, or if you feel somewhat disconnected or confused, it just means that you need to experiment with this and be prepared to make mistakes and maybe go down the wrong path because you learn as much from the quote unquote wrong turns as you learn from the right ones. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, I'm just thinking now, it sounds like, <clears throat> you know, being open-minded is important for this, um, but also being aware of distractions and maybe limiting distractions, right? I mean, again, let's go back to how we can, how we can get more in touch with this, how we can actually experience this um, more readily. How do you mean limiting distractions? Well, um, especially today, you know, we always have technology and there's all this media. There's always something, you know, s something trying to tell you what to do, whether it's like, you know, advertisements. And there's all these distractions and I feel like it could be hard to actually um, know what you're, you're really interested in, what you're really truly drawn to. Yeah, I think it's it's valuable to take breaks. Now... Some people like to meditate, but you can also do things like anything that calms, calms you down or it could be taking a walk, doing sports, in your case, maybe playing music, mm -hmm. thing, things like that, that give your mind a break from all the information. But something else that I've noticed is that when I'm on the wrong path or doing the wrong things, I tend to feel anxious, agitated, frustrated even angry, that's when I know that I need to take a break because the way I see it or the way what I've noticed is that my feelings also tell me if I'm on the right path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's being in touch with your feelings also. And uh, some of the other interviews that I've done, we definitely 
So we definitely covered that. Um, what are some things that you do, you know, like you said, when, when you need to take a break, you mentioned like going for a walk or meditating, what do you actually do? Well, it's, it's very fluid. So I tend to not do any one thing or have routine. Sometimes, mm -hmm. for example, I've been meditating for, I think it's over a decade now. So I do that almost on a daily basis. And so meditation is one thing. I might take a walk. I might just watch a TV series, which is not really not relaxing, but I like to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I clean, I do the dishes. It's just, again, it comes down to something that pulls me in. So even these small things are indicators for me as to what I can do. So I might feel like cleaning or I might feel like meditating. So that's what I do. And that usually helps me clear my head. And again, you said that you might feel like doing any of these things. It's about what you feel like doing, right? Yeah. And again, this brings us into interesting territory because sometimes you don't feel like doing something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just trying to think about how to put this. So I guess when it comes to breaks, when I choose among breaks, you could say, then I just do what's most interesting to me or what appeals to me. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to things like, for example, when you're writing a book, I, in the beginning, I felt drawn to writing a book and I took a course, I learned things. But then when I started writing the book, I came upon fears and doubts. And you could look at that and say that, okay, I'm not feeling good, so this must be wrong. But you have to make the distinction between fear and something feeling off, like mm -hmm. something you're not drawn towards. So I was drawn towards writing a book, but I had fears and... Mm -hmm. That's when I had to find a way to keep taking tiny steps and move forward because deep down I still felt drawn to writing books and getting them out there. Yeah, so how how can we make that distinction? What do we what do we look for? Hmm, let's see. Well I guess I could I could stay with the example, so I focus on tiny steps and what I do is moment to moment I let's say keeping to writing books as I start writing it's I'm just I'm remembering my first book I started writing it was easy and then I started bumping into fears mm -hmm. now the distinction is that it's something I'd want to do so you could ask you ask yourself that if you didn't feel fear or if you weren't afraid of anything, would you still keep doing this? Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I do all that automatically at, at this stage. So I know when I feel drawn towards something while I'm afraid of doing it. And something else that helps you clear your mind or become more clear about if something is stopping you is to do some journaling or free writing, just writing down your thoughts uncensored on paper because that starts showing you the patterns and thoughts you have that are swirling around because we all have specific fears and things we're afraid of. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense or do you need do you need more? No, that's good. And uh again, it's it, it can be we can kind of keep it simple, right? It's it's just you know, you, you mentioned that obviously there's these fears even if it's something that you're interested in, but if you eliminated those fears, would you still be interested in what you're doing? Right? Yeah, and you have to remember that often when you're doing something you enjoy, doing something you love, you may be more afraid of it mm -hmm. than doing something else, something easier like working a job that you feel lukewarm about because it feels like there's something more at stake. If you're doing something you enjoy and you fail, then you failed 
for the rest of your life. Now, obviously, that's an assumption and an interpretation that isn't true, mm-hmm. but that's how it feels for most people. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about how this comes into play with you know some of the larger things in life, like achieving success and creating happiness and all of that. So how, how, how does following our, following our inner authority and listening to that, how is that going to help us achieve, you know, success in life? Well, I think success, we, we don't want just want success. We want what comes with success, which are the feelings, like feelings of freedom, security, mm-hmm. happiness, whatever comes with that. So when you follow your inner authority and you're on the right path, then you find success that's right for you. You don't get stuck on chasing a certain path just because someone told you that was the right way to go or that you you somehow learned to go down that path. Instead, you keep taking small steps, you keep following what feels magnetic and at least in my case and the people I've helped, that brings you to a place where you just feel good about what you're doing and you achieve success, but it's fulfilling success, not mm-hmm. just success. And it's your it's your own. And, you know, you, you, you mentioned that. you. I mean, I think the idea of success is um, it's kind of a hazy term because it can mean a lot of things to different people. But we're t- what we're talking about here is creating your own success that's that's yours not what you know society or the media is telling you you should be doing yeah and it's it's also helpful to sit down and explore your definition of success because so many people are chasing success without even knowing what success means to them so it's it's helpful to sit down and explore not only your definition of success but what every anything else that you feel is important. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think what else we could cover here because I think it is, it's a fairly simple concept, right? I don't want to make it more complicated than we need to. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's kind of like poker. It's easy to learn, but it takes a lifetime to master. Yeah. So what I always tell people is to not take it too seriously and not take yourself too seriously because the more willing you are to just explore what this means to you and to make mistakes the faster you learn because the people I see making the fastest progress are those that are open and those that are willing to just find out for themselves what's going on and sometimes you can do that sometimes you can't so even struggling with this is okay. The problems start when you start. You're too hard on yourself. You you listen to those thoughts in your head that tell you that you should be better than this or no no more or already have done this and all, all those different things get in the way of just living life one moment at a time and letting it be simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a theme that I'm seeing here, you know, listening to you is that being present and aware is is very important for all of this. Um, do you think that your meditative practice has been sort of fundamental in in this whole process for you? Um, I'd say I've always been aware of things. Mm-hmm. So meditation has helped me dive deeper into the things that stop me from moving forward. So the fears and my thought patterns and beliefs. But this doesn't mean that it's something everyone should do because for some people, their meditation is music or taking a walk, Mm -hmm. exercising or playing sports or something else. Yeah. And that I'm I'm glad you said that because we've, we've talked about meditation in some of the other um, interviews and I do agree that meditate. I mean, I think meditation is a great practice and it's great for a lot of people. Um, but I think it is important for, for our listeners to realize that 
there are other ways to go about meditation other than just, you know, sitting down quietly and, you know, li observing your breath. There, like you, you said, you know, it, it could be playing music or, you know, going for a walk or, you know, really anything I think can be made into a meditative practice depending how you approach it. Yeah, exactly, because most, the let's take the standard meditation practice of focusing on one thing, which is your breath or or a ma mantra or something else. That's mm -hmm. just, you're focusing on one thing, and that one thing could be washing dishes or yeah. being aware of your body when you're walking or being aware of the music or when you're playing guitar or something else. Mm -hmm. So another thing is that the way I discovered meditation in the way I do it today was simply by, again, following what felt interesting to me. So that's how it all started. So it comes comes back down to your inner authority and following what 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 feels magnetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is just as simple as that. Yeah, I think it's tricky because you can listen to a lot of different things, and I was this way not too long ago, where I would listen to things, and I might I might might have felt bad because I felt like I should have done certain things. So let's say you hear a lot about meditation and you don't really feel like doing it. It's it's not interesting, but you feel like you should. Mm -hmm. So this is again where your inner authority comes in and you either resonate with meditation or you don't. And that might change tomorrow or a week from now. But that's what I do. I listen at this stage. I've done this for, I've li listened to myself for many years, so I've grown to trust myself to let things come to me that are right for me at the right time. And sometimes I make mistakes, but again, I try not to be too harsh on myself. So it again comes down to me, at least for me, it comes down to just noticing what resonates for me and doing my best to follow that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's important to, to know that those things will change, right? Certain things will resonate with you at different times, depending on if you're ready for them or not. And even if you do something and it doesn't work out, it's it's a learning process, right? Like you said, you'd, we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. Yeah, because something working out doesn't mean that it's a failure. So this is a, another good point because it may feel like, let's say, if I would have started writing my books and no one would have bought those books or I somehow would have failed, then it's easy to say that, okay, that was a waste of time because you didn't get the results. But those results could manifest in a different way. So you may have polished your writing skills mm -hmm. and then down the road you could have gotten a job freelance writing or something else so this for me was one of the one of the reasons I started small in follow my inner authority because I didn't really trust myself and I didn't want to risk too much mm -hmm. but when I noticed that when I simply followed what interests me then it somehow was relevant to my life no matter what I thought so it's interesting to think about this because we make assumptions that if things don't happen in a certain way, then we can't get something else. When in fact, that's just our inter interpret interpretation of things mm -hmm. and it's not the truth. Yeah. And I think it comes down to perspective also, you know, having that perspective that even if something is hard or, you know, a, a quote unquote failure, we can still learn from it and it will be a, a worthwhile experience regardless of, you know, the results. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's all um, a growth experience and you're constantly, if you're not getting something on the outside, then you're always getting something on the inside. You're learning about the world, you're learning about your attitude, your fears, your beliefs, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that things can change. 
And I completely agree because we are never just making a choice and living with that choice because what we're doing is constantly choosing to do something. Mm -hmm. So in a relationship, that might mean, you, I mean, you, you could say that, well, I choose to, I chose to be with this person for the rest of my life, but I don't necessarily see that as accurate because what we're doing is choosing to be with that person in each moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I mean, <laughs> this can open up a whole, you know, other conversation about um, getting attached to things. Um, but yeah, I agree. It is, it's easy for us to, to get attached to things and to identify with what we're doing or, you know, different things in our lives, whether it's our jobs or, you know, even, you know, something like diet or you know, our, our interests, our hobbies, whatever, it's easy to get attached to those things and to, to forget that we, we do have a choice to, to let those go moment to moment. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's another good exercise to notice that the things you're attached to are often the things that you either identify with or you think are important for your survival or success mm -hmm. so i like diving into these things and really exploring what i'm afraid of if i were to lose the things i'm attached to and that helps me see that it's my interpretation of things that i'm afraid of or that gives rise to fear because we're always feeling our thoughts we're never feeling the world out there because let's say you have a job and you're afraid of losing that job. Well, you're not afraid of losing the job. You're afraid of your thoughts about the job and your interpretations about it. So diving into these things and really seeing what you're afraid of and how you came to form those interpretations is helpful because when you see, let's say, you're, you're afraid of losing your job because you, money is important and you don't want to be, let's say, homeless. And you notice that those interpretations and those beliefs came from your childhood because your father always, he was always stressed about things or maybe something went wrong. And as a kid or a young adult, you assigned a meaning to these events. So again, it's helpful to see that it's just one meaning, one perspective, and someone else might have a completely different perspective on those things. And that means they would live life in a different way. So just exploring these things, exploring the things that make you uncomfortable is what I've found gives you, gives me the most reward or helps me move forward because I see that the things I'm afraid of aren't really real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it helps you to to understand everything on, on a deeper level. And before you cut out, you mentioned that sometimes you actually sit down and you, you work this out on paper, or you write things out. Um, what what does that actually look like? What do you actually do? Again, it's, it's not, I don't have a specific process, so... Mm -hmm this changes from time to time but i'd say i start by i start by exploring what it is that I'm, that I'm afraid of and i get i try to get into specifics so if i'm afraid of let's say let's say you're afraid of losing your job then it's not just losing your your job you're afraid of because there's consequences to that that you envision in your mind, either consciously or unconsciously. So what I do is I explore the consequences. I explore what specifically I'm afraid of. I might, I might explore what triggered this fear. And then when I have those specifics, I'll start breaking them down. So I'll... Let's say I look at counterexamples, other interpretation, other possible interpretations, and 
you could say it's kind of like you're challenging a belief or a thought because you're looking for evidence and any thought or any belief you have has evidence to it or at least things that feel like evidence. Mm -hmm. So I'm writing things down. I'm getting very specific because if you're just saying I'm afraid of losing my job, it's harder to get a handle on it because it's so vague. Yeah. So you get down into specifics. You look at what's really going on and what you're thinking and you start looking for examples to the contrary. You start looking for evidence that you might be wrong. And doing this starts, or it helps you let go because it shows your mind that what you feel to be true is just one truth. And it doesn't really mean that something bad will happen. So that's one way I do it. Something else... I like to do is simply to notice that whatever I'm feeling comes from my thoughts. So one thing I like to do is simply lie down and notice that I can observe my thoughts and I observe that thoughts give rise to feelings. Mm -hmm. And this might be harder for people. I don't know. It's always been something that came naturally to me. So I have an easy time noticing that when I'm feeling something, it also means that I'm thinking something. Yeah. So when I'm afraid of something, or if you're afraid of something, you could ask yourself, what would you have to think or believe to feel this feeling? Mm -hmm. So that gives you an in into your thoughts. And again, you can start writing them, do them down and diving into specifics. Does that make sense? Yeah. and And all of this is really just going to help us to be um less attached and more more present in the moment which is going to allow us to be able to to more fully listen and follow our inner authorities and be really be ourselves right yeah because the more aware you are of what's going on inside of you and how your fears are pushing you here and there the less likely you are to get caught up in those fears because mm -hmm. I remember 10 years ago, I might, might have had a fear come up and I'd be lost in it for weeks, just trying to figure things out and trying to solve it when there was nothing to be solved because it was all in my head. Mm -hmm. So the more awareness you bring to this and the more you get to know yourself, the less you're caught up in it, which means that you'll have more access to clarity and your inner authority and just following what feels magnetic in your life. Mm -hmm. Well said. <laughs> um, we're coming up on the end of the conversation here, Henry. There's one question that, that I'd like to ask you, um, but before I do that, is there anything else that you'd like to cover? No, I think, I think that's it. The only thing is to remind people that this doesn't have to be serious and it's not a race to some perfection because you'll always go through the roller coaster of human emotions. So you'll have sadness and depression, you'll have joy, you'll have calm and all of those emotions come and go, thoughts come and go. But we're simply in this living life as best we can. So simply do the best you can with what you have and relax. Mm hmm I like that. It's nice and simple. <laughs> and, it's, and I think it it will go a long way towards helping people. You know, a, a little bit will go a long way. Yeah, just, just getting started is, is the big part mm -hmm. that I've noticed. Yeah. Okay, Henry. Um, I've been asking this to the other guys that I've been interviewing. Are there any mistakes or is there a single mistake that you've made in your life that you'd be willing to share with us so that we might learn from that mistake? Hmm, is there is there any specific any more any anything you can can you elaborate and just anything you've done in your life that um that might stick out in your head as like a, maybe a major lesson that you learned or uh, you know a major mistake that you've made let's see it's nothing really comes to mind but i'm i'm sure we can dig mm -hmm. because <laughs> i feel like mis 
mistakes, like they're a part of my life, so I don't see them as something bad. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of lessons. I guess one thing that comes to mind was has to do with the stock market. And I basically, I was playing poker and I let someone else manage my money and it didn't turn out well. So I lost 50,000 plus mm -hmm. because he was too eager. And it just showed me that I can't be in a rush to do something. So it happened because I was too eager. Yeah. And I wanted something so much that... I was willing to live in my own delusion, basically, and not listen to my own inner authority because I was rushing to do something when, in fact, it felt wrong from the start. So yeah, that's one lesson that comes to mind. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing for that with us. And uh, I like that you were able to tie it into the whole concept we were talking about here, that it, it really didn't feel right, but you did it anyways. <laughs> yeah, I find there's a lot of the those moments in life where you kind of know it's not the right thing but you do it anyway because it makes sense logically or you feel like or you think that it's the secure path to take in life mm -hmm. yeah i think it's it's all too common and hopefully this conversation we had is going to help people steer steer people away from that yeah and again it's sometimes you have to go down that path and make some mistakes and you just learn all the more when you do that and you wake up a few years later yeah a little bit wiser from it right <laughs> yeah hopefully all right henry thanks so much for doing this it's been great talking to you um i'm sure we'll have another conversation like this sometime in the future but yeah thanks for doing this yeah thanks for having me and for asking great questions of course thanks so much and live life based on what feels good for them instead of listening to all of these outside factors, which is funny because I'm an outside factor telling people not to listen to outside factors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much my story summed up. I guess you can ask more specific questions if you want to dive into anything. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I really like the idea that, you know, you talk about following your inner authority, um, and I, I like the fact that it's sort of encouraging people to to be themselves, you know, and like you said, not necessarily listening to a certain guru to be like this or be like that, but it's more, you know, find what's right for you. And I think that's that's important for people to hear. Yeah, and what it comes down to is, I mean, you can listen to other people because we can't not do that. So it comes down to listening to yourself as to what kind of advice fits with you and how you can apply that to your life. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, tell us uh, what, you know, your concept of the inner authority is. What does that really mean? Well, what I found is that we all have something within us. Some people call it intuition. Some call it inner authority. Some call it living through feeling. I don't really get stuck on any one label because to me it all comes down to listening to yourself and the way you do that or the way I do that is by noticing what feels alive to me. It's kind of like something feels magnetic. Mm -hmm. So it's... Okay, Henry, let's uh, start this off with you telling us a little bit about your story, um, what you're doing now, and everything that led to that. Okay, so at the age of 18, I guess we'll start there, I became a professional poker player, mm -hmm. and I did that. I made a living doing that and explored life and the world. I traveled a bit, 
And then at the age of 21, I started looking into online business, but I didn't succeed or find a way to make it work until I was 23, which is when I quit poker and focused everything on building my business. I started with advertising, then affiliate marketing, then I moved into Wake Up Cloud, which is my website and main business today. So mm-hmm. I started in 2009 and so I've been doing that since then, which is over five years, I think now. Yeah, about. <laughs> and that's where I'm at right now. I'm help, be helping people do what they love and discover their inner authority. Just the fact that you need to experiment with this because there's no one formula. Yeah. We all have different ways of tapping into our authority. So for me, it comes down to feeling and I feel things over time. So if I need to make a decision or a big decision like buying a house or buying a car, I usually don't do that or try not to do that overnight because I know that my I need to go through some time and I need to let things rest. Mm-hmm. Now, for other people, they might know in the moment that they want something and when they, when they follow their feelings and their gut or heart that way, then it works out. And another example could be someone that needs to talk to someone. They need to talk things out to really get to know what they want mm-hmm. and so on. So that's why it's important to experiment with this. And usually there you've already found your thing. It may be something you did in your childhood or earlier in life that you've lost touch with. Okay, so you mentioned, you know, like talking to somebody else that might be your way. What are some ways that we can get more in touch with this inner authority? Well, first I'd say to start listening to yourself more. Mm -hmm. And it's already there, but what blocks it from, or what blocks us or disconnects us from that is, are the fears we have, the thoughts we have of what we should do, how we should behave and how how things should be. So it's kind of like you're holding a ball underwater and once you stop holding it, it bounces back to the surface Mm -hmm. like it does naturally. So some of the practical ways that I help people with this is simply to start unraveling the fears and thoughts that hold you back because we all already have this ability. It's just that we're holding us back, holding ourselves back from tapping into it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what are some practical steps? Are there any like exercises or practices that you, you help people with? Let's see. Well, I'd say to start small. So you can start noticing day to day what you want to do. So instead of thinking big, like if you want to quit your job or how you feel about your job, then start smaller in, for example, if you want to read a book, then don't, don't just read a book because you should read it, but read it because it feels magnetic or because it resonates with you in some way. Mm -hmm. And this is how I started because I'm naturally skeptical and I like for things to make sense. So I started small and my mind wasn't really on board because this is, this, as you've, as you've noticed, it's hard to explain and teach. So what I did, I want to make the distinction here because it's easy to think that if you feel like you want chocolate, then obviously that feels good because you get chocolate. But there's a distinction between sensory desire and pleasure and something that comes from deeper within us. It's it's kind of like a subtle nudge to do something. And it usually comes for me with a relaxed feeling. So it's not not that high strong feeling that desire or sensory desire Mm -hmm. comes with but something more relaxed so that's that's what i what i found that we have within us and when we listen to our 
own inner authority, then we're automatically on the right path and it eliminate, eliminates a lot of the overwhelm because we can only take one step at a time and we can only live right now. So you can only do what you can with what you have. And when you do that, life becomes simpler. Mm -hmm. So the inner authority, I mean, you, you talked about like, you know, having a desire for chocolate. The inner authority might not necessarily be that desire, but there might be that voice in the back of your head somewhere that's telling you that you probably shouldn't have that chocolate. Would Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. There's also an, another distinction, and that is that we do a lot of shooting and what we should and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So those, you could say that those get in the way of listening to our inner authority. So this is why... I also st 